Our next speaker is uh, Dan McClary. He's going to be talking to us about uh, moving out of the ivory tower and into the uh, grand world of reality. So thanks, Dan. OK, so here we are. Oh, sorry. Age. I just swap for the other glasses. Age hits me. Wind theory meets reality. So this is an update of, much, much like Mara, uh, two years ago talked about this project with just one we're going to get underway with. So we're going to evaluate some of these tools, some of these in-water cleaning tools. So this is the project update two years down the track. We actually have a little bit of information behind us, which is nice. So these first couple of slides are the same as they were a few years ago. So we're dealing with reactive in-water cleaning systems. If you were at all awake yesterday or earlier on, you'd know that there are some pretty stringent standards for biofouling uh, on vessels in New Zealand. And there, as a consequence, there is an urgent need for in-water cleaning tools that will actually meet these both biosecurity and environmental standards. So the objectives of the program are obviously to test some in-water cleaning systems, uh, model chemical contamination, so we're going to be looking at the contaminants as well as the biosecurity issues, and then, and perhaps the biggest one, is actually assessing the utility of the framework that's been put together for um, testing these particular pieces of equipment. So where have we got to so far? Well, we've made some reasonable progress. We're not entirely there yet. Um, in the ideal world, we'd be all finished by now and it'd be all wrapped up, reports done, out, uh, everybody's paid. It's not quite the case. Things take longer. If you're dealing with ships, as all of you know, if you're dealing with ships, things take longer than you initially anticipate. So what have we done? We've compiled information on the different types of hull cleaning technologies available. We've done assessments of whether or not they're appropriate for what we need to, to actually test. We have conducted some field trials to see that that particular the check mark beside field trials is a little bit smaller than the others because we really only finished half of what we wanted to do. There's still more to come. And we're in the middle of part of the reporting cycle. So the requirements that we have uh, speci specifically, they must demonstrably capture the arisings of hull cleaning. That's the key thing. And we are talking in water hull cleaning, obviously. The systems have to be suitable for large vessels. So there are a lot of systems out there which can handle small recreational vessels. That's great, but we need to be looking at something for big vessels. They need to be uh, systems that are suitable for reactive cleaning. So it's a biosecurity concern that we're dealing with. We need to deal with big mussels or big barnacles or whatever it is. And they also have to be, the systems also be, have to be at a fairly advanced stage of, of development. So we're not going to use something that's that's a great idea in someone's head. We're not going to try and test that because it's not testable. You really, you really need to have something that's pretty much at the go stage. We came across a, a number of different candidate systems. I'm just going to skip through this. And we know down to just a couple of systems that we are going to test. And I'll just pick up on what Mario had sort of made an initial discussion about earlier is the idea of these different, the different acronyms that are floating around out there. There's the passive in-water, or I should say the proactive in-water cleaning systems is the reactive in-water cleaning systems. The key thing that we're looking at with this proactive systems is that you're really talking about hull maintenance, and it's something that can be um, really incorporated into the normal management and operational routines of the vessel, and that's really a key importance when you think about that. The flip side of it, and what we're particularly interested in from the biosecurity uh, perspective, is those uh, that reactive in-water cleaning capture systems. So we've got a rapid response focus. It's not just hull maintenance. It's not as part of the normal routine operations of the vessel, so it's not easy to program it in. It's, oh, we've got a ship. It's demonstrably dirty. It's a biosecurity risk. We need to deal to it right now. So the consequence of that non-routine nature is that it interrupts routine vessel operations. And as soon as you start interrupting routine vessel operations, things start getting costly. I think as John was mentioning yesterday, the difference between commercial vessels and Navy vessels or, or warships is that commercial vessels have to be making money all the time. A day idle is a day, a very expensive day of no income. Okay, so the two systems that we have chosen to look at, uh, they're relatively similar overall. I mean, high volume suction, so you're getting all the material that's all the arising, it's capturing the arisings. Um, there's a diver operative, operative brush cart systems, or cart systems, I should say, for the, hull, the flat hull surfaces, and shrouded hand tools or containment type systems for niche area cleaning. 
Also, on top of that, you obviously have to deal with the risings themselves, so you've got micro-level filtration, there's post-process treatment. Now, you see that I haven't put any names in here. Most of you probably know what the names are, but I'm bound by non-disclosure arrangements. I can't say anything. And you won't see a lot of actual data as a consequence in this particular presentation. So for the sampling itself, um, basically we're sampling both the vessel and the, the system, how well it works. So there's, there are a lot of samples, digital still and video imagery, both before and after to document what's going on. We've got uh, sampling, uh, seawater samples collected obviously, and we're sampling um, at discrete intervals. So we're sampling individual water samples. It's not a continuous sampling program we've got, so that complicates things slightly doing biofouling scrapes before cleaning and also leach layer scrapes before cleaning as well to get an indication of, you know, what biofouling is there and also what's the chemical contamination present in the, in the paint itself or in the coating. The sampling plan, again, I'm not going to stick on this too long. Basically, look at the main number at the bottom for each uh, sample or for each system, 496 samples. There's a lot of stuff happening. There's a lots of moving parts to collect that many samples in a short time. And remember, we're dealing with vessels that don't want to hang around for a long period of time. So we're going at this hammer and tong for a short period. It makes it challenging in some instances. So the before cleaning section of sampling, and again, I'll just skip through them because you won't, may not be able to read all this, but basically there's a lot of samples that we're collecting off, off the hull itself. And if you try and, these, this is all based on this, in advance, this is what we're going to do. We're going to sample here and here. We're going to sample these half a meter away and two meters away or 50 meters away, whatever it is. Basically, contaminants, TSS, what we were looking for there for those discrete samples, as well as looking at um, the biosecurity issues, particulates, and also looking at the um, what's actually present on the hull before and after. Biofilm leach layer scrapes, as I mentioned before, we're cleaning off the biofilm, both on the planar hull surface and also in the particular niche areas as well. Okay, that was before, now we're moving on to during cleaning. So obviously the niche cleaners, so we're looking at things like, like anodes or maybe we're looking at uh, transducers or something else, something else you can't readily drive a cart across. So we're again sampling very close within a half a meter upstream, downstream and adjacent to the system itself. Also using not just niche cleaners, but cleaning carts as the planar hull surfaces. Divers are collecting discrete water samples adjacent to the system for contaminants. Same thing upstream, downstream, and adjacent. And again, we're also using digital stills and video recording. So if you look at this a little bit closer, if you look at, we're not just looking at a single pass of a diving cart or a cleaning cart across the hull. We're looking at multiple passes. So basically one swath, turn around, Another swath, turn around, so back and forth like this, with a number of turning areas. Obviously, the machine, machine has to turn around and re reorient itself. So in this, this first pass, so we're doing, or I should say the second, second pass, we're doing three samples ahead of the operating machine. And remember, this machine is moving. It's not just a static system. It's actually, the idea is that this machine is moving along as part of normal operations. And then adjacent and behind. And then it's going to do a turn, and it's going to come around. You're going to do another set of, of sampling ahead, downstream, upstream, downstream, and adjacent. And you can then do that a number of times. So you're going to get several different passes, uh, several different turns. Uh, in the turning, the turning cycles, we're not collecting physical samples during the turning cycles, but we're watching. So we've got divers in the water watching to see, is anything happen? Is anything being knocked off the hull? So we want to make it basically assess whether or not it is actually a biosecure cleaning system, the whole thing, not just the cleaning, but the operations around it. So the testing, this where theory meets reality. This is all things we wanted to do. Now, does it work in the field? Um, we had to make a number of uh, modifications or additions to the testing protocol. The protocols itself are focused on biosecurity, but obviously, Chemical contamination is a big issue, which, as I've indicated, we've rolled that into the sampling program. That complicates matters somewhat because you're collecting a lot of discrete samples. We reduced the pre-clean pre sampling to once per vessel. Uh, again, and the idea behind doing that is basically cost. 
sampling for contaminants is very expensive. The uh, contaminants analysis, the analytical costs are quite high. So in order to reduce it down into a budget, we had to reduce the number of pre-clean sampling we did. Prior to going into the field, obviously you make up your plans and your standard operating procedures, what you want to do. And then once you get out in the field, things happen. Things change and you actually have to change things somewhat. And I'll talk about those a little bit. And in particular, how you have to sometimes change the sequence of samplings, basically related to the vessel configuration. Okay, so reality checks. Timing, first off. Last minute vessel operations can change impact sampling. Uh, you've got changes in vessel availability. We've all worked, we've probably all worked with ships. We know the fact that these things move around and they move around at a great rate of knots, literally. Often th oftentimes things change at very last minute. So you have to be able to think on your feet and change things. Changes in scheduling are important as well. I mean, we had, we had all set up to do some of this work several months ago, well, actually, sort of a year ago, say almost a year ago, had people sort of scheduling their, um, their annual leave. And then suddenly things are delayed and delayed and now all of a sudden my key field member is gone, is on annual leave. Okay, so you just have to change. So you have to work in personnel flexibility as well. It's really important. There are also significant commercial implications for sampling. Obviously, vessel operations are very costly and you're subject to a lot of external factors. So the commercial operational needs, um, the weather as well, you might have to put off sampling because the weather just rolls in, so you gotta deal with that. The testing itself is actually quite time consuming. It takes three to four days to do the, the pre-clean sampling and then the sampling itself. Now for a commercial vessel, that's three to four days when you're not operating, and that's bad. So there'll be a push to try and move along as quickly as possible. The individual cleaning system components, not just the system itself, but the individual components which are reusable, or I should say consumable, um, they're quite costly. They can cost from hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they've got a limited shelf life potentially, so you've got to use it. Um, and that's all part of the commercial implications of the, of the cleaning. The operations themselves are costly. You are talking 12-hour days at least, and oftentimes more for the sampling, sampling crew would have to deal with the samples afterwards. Um, you're talking about big teams of people, eight to 10 people, 15 people in some cases, where you've got a lot of stuff. There's a lot of moving parts, lots of people to organize. And again, I've indicated before, the contaminants analysis are quite costly. So yeah, it's expensive. We know this. Another thing you've got to take into account is system reliability. I mean, these are very complicated, very complex systems. Yes, they work, and they work extremely well but nothing's 100% reliable. There's always downtime, you've got to stop. Okay, we gotta stop. Even if you lose an hour or two a day where you're trying to rig a jig a particular system, when you've got a limited amount of time in the field, things have to change as a consequence. Again, contingency planning, that's absolutely critical. Now the reality check, collecting discrete samples from a mobile system is not easy. So if something's trundling along at our maybe a meter per second, it's probably not going that fast. But when it's moving longer, trying to get in there in front of it and take a sample, which doesn't happen instantaneously. This thing's moving towards you and you go take a sample. That's not easy. Um, there are health and safety challenges with working with this sort of thing as well, because um, you're working underneath ships, so everybody's on surface supply. All the divers are on surface supply. There's a lot of umbilicals floating around. Um, you've got a lot of divers. The, the, the hoses that are used to attract the pull the risings up to the treatment system. That's more stuff in the water. So as a consequence of that, the original sampling program, the way we actually sampled this moving piece of equipment had to change because it was just too risky. Someone was gonna get hurt. Basically the whole system is very, the whole sampling system is very tightly choreographed in order for it to happen. We we're also trying to have uh, we also thought, okay, maybe we shouldn't be switching over to continuous sampling, but that wouldn't give us the information we want, that discrete samples, they're really quite critical for what we need to do. We also tried to coordinate sampling um, from the filtration system and the cleaning head and the discharges so that we knew what was happening at the same time. So we wanted to say, if we collect material at the cleaning head, how long is it gonna take before that material goes through the whole cleaning system and is discharged. And how long is that gonna take for it gets through the cleaning system and then is actually out in the water and then 50 meters away. So we were trying to coordinate the timing based on you know, volumetric calculations and flow through. Uh, no, 
that was never going to happen effectively, unfortunately. Um, we've got some data. We're looking at the data now, but we're still, the, the jury is out, unfortunately. Another significant one is that vessel configuration, apart from operation, but the vessel configuration really has an impact on your sampling design. If you're dealing with a commercial vessel, big planar surfaces of the hull, you can have discrete locations where you're doing the sampling, great. But if you're dealing with, say, other vessels that have a lot of niches or a lot of uh, appendages or hull appendages or anodes or sensors, um, stabilizers, all of that can actually interrupt with your sampling what you're trying to do. As the example for this particular vessel we were working on in this, this first set of cleaning trials that we did, the idea is that we would have three separate cleaning trials on this ship, one bow, one midships, one aft. We do the whole system at once, do one set of cleaning trials, move on to the next replicate in the middle, finalize the next replicate down back. That's all well and good except for the fact that the reality is there are a lot of appendages on these particular vessels. There's bilge cables, there's stabilizer fins, there's anodes galore, there's, I think there's like 70 or 80 anodes on this thing. Um, lots of sea chests as well. So it's challenging to try and find space where you can actually turn the, this particular piece of equipment in a fairly small area. For this particular type of vessel, there's only two spots, one at the bow and one at the stern. So okay, so we had to modify the sampling program somewhat. So what we did is basically sequential trials. We'd start off at the bow, do one trial, and then continue driving towards midships, do the second trial, continue driving towards the stern, do the other trial. Turn, come back, do the stern, do trial three, then next replicate of trial two, moving forward, next replicate of trial one. So the argument could be made, well, these are all interdependent. Yeah. yeah, okay, but again, theory and reality. It'd be nice to do three separate ones, but for this particular vessel, which was the only one that was available in the time frame that we had to work in, this is what we had to do. Finally, different system types will require different types of, of testing, obviously. If you're dealing with a a fixed unit which is not moving, then it's very easy to do things like die testing. You just go in and, and while it's operating, you just squirt the die where you have to. Uh, if you're dealing with a system that's actually moving along, trundling along at so many meters per second, then that's another issue. Even the question of what equipment you use underwater. I mean, the idea with the die testing is that we'd use a 50 mil syringe, get close and within, say, 10 centimeters of the active cleaning head, you would squirt some of the die in and watch what happens. Okay, well, this thing's moving along. You've got a diver on an umbilical with other umbilicals floating around trying to squirt something in. It didn't work. So in the end, you get a plastic bottle filled with a dye. Get close, squeeze it. Operationally, it works. Is it as nice looking as using a syringe or as elegant or as precise? No. But again, it worked. Now, as has been noted, in the actual protocols themselves, the components have to be assessed both individually and collectively. So it's all well and good to look at, say, one particular piece of equipment and say, oh, well, you know, it's a fail because it missed a barnacle. But if that one piece of equipment is only one part of the entire system that's used to clean the vessel, so it's not just the brush cart or the cleaning cart, it's not just the, the hand tool that's being used, it's actually everything all at once. So the protocol really needs to look at, um, basically look at it holistically. Does this clean a vessel and an average vessel? And obviously you've got to test a lot of different types of vessels. So the question that comes to us is that, well, you know, you've done this testing, this first round of testing, there's more to come. Did it actually work? Did any, was anything really useful? And much like Mario's found is that yes, and then there are challenges but you can do this testing. The testing for biosecurity containment is relatively straightforward. Um, the assessment of, assessment of cleaning efficiency of efficacy is relatively achieve, is easily achievable. Dye testing should be used more comprehensively, not just at the, that at the cleaning head, but also at different points along the system, different joins, different areas where, you know, where you've got one hose connected to another. You probably should do some dye testing there. So that's, that's important to actually incorporate into it. All the system components really need to be tested as a unified package. It's not just one piece. It's a number of different pieces in this particular puzzle. And the key thing that when you're in the field and you've got lots of these different moving parts happening is that you've really got to be prepared. You've got to be, think on your feet and be able to really be flexible with respect to making things happen. 
And on that basis, thank you, Eugene, MPI team, and also the, the team with Oceans Marine, Oceans One Marine Consulting. Great, thanks. <laughs>